So uh, I'm Andrew Sarangan from Electro Optics in the School of Engineering. I'm going to tell you some uh, information about the, some of the things that we're doing. One of the areas is uh, image sensors. Now, when I say image sensors, some people ask, well, so you, can you read fingerprints from a distance? Can you read facial expressions? That kind of stuff. That's not the area. We work on the hardware. We make the chips. We make the sensors and some of the new technologies that go into the sensors like uh, detecting infrared, thermal emissions, uh, ultraviolet emission. So the sensor component is, is the area of focus, not the image processing. We got experts in the University of Dayton who do that field. The image processing is, is a different area from, from the hardware uh, material science that I'm going to talk about here at the end. So just to put it in context, uh, silicon is the main material that's used in all, uh, uh, all, virtually all image sensors. You know, there's a little silicon chip, uh, commercially fairly cheap. It's all in your cell phones and all of that. And the material that goes into that is silicon. So silicon is the rock or the, the dirt that's in your, uh, on Earth. So that's one of the most abundant material. It's very cheap. It's extracted, purified, made into silicon wafers. Uh, there a laser pointer? Not here. Oh, yeah. All right. So this is a silicon wafer, and uh, and you can design pixels within each pixel. There is a photo detector, and there is some electronics right on the pixel that amplifies, also uh, enables that detector and disables that detector based on whether you are requesting information from that or not. And uh, they are sold in large quantities and large megapixel type range, multi-megapixel cameras. These are all came out of silicon, and it's a fairly mature technology. That's because silicon is used in electronics, so it's all driven by computer industry and uh, a whole a host of varieties made silicon industry uh, very economical and advanced at the same time. Uh, one of, the, uh, one of the properties of silicon is that it works up to the wavelength range of 1100 nanometer or 1.1 micron, which is in the near infrared range. Uh, so it covers visible, so it's great for visible cameras that we use in consumer applications, but it cannot detect anything beyond 1100 nanometers, which is in the short wave infrared and, and beyond. So it can detect ultraviolet all the way to uh, near infrared. So typically, you see these kind of color pattern, green, red, and blue is, is what they are used in visu visible sensor applications. So if we look at thermal imaging, thermal imaging is really not much different than your regular camera, except we are detecting its different wavelength regime. So I plotted here the emission spectrum of a 300 Kelvin, that's background, so all your walls and every, all the furniture is at that temperature. This is the emission spectrum of a 300 Kelvin object. It emits around 9 micron wavelength, so it's significantly longer than the silicon 1100 nanometer uh, wavelength. Uh, and contrast that, a human body temperature, 345 Kelvin, uh, that shifts, it, so the intensity goes up and it shifts to a slightly towards a shorter wavelength. Nevertheless, these are all well beyond the silicon range. So when we are talking about thermal radiation, what we mean, all our hot objects are emitting photons, just like the sun. Sun is emitting photons because it's so hot. It's, it's over 5,000 degrees. And uh, human bodies and any hot object is also emitting photon. And we are all hot objects. And I don't mean we are you know, hot you know, in that sense, but uh, we are warm. So we are, <laughs> we are, although some of you are hot, but... <laughs> Uh, not, not me. Um, <laughs> so, so, uh, so there are specific bands that have been designated for detecting infrared thermal radiation. Uh, three to five microns is a, is a commercially uh, available, uh, there's a lot of products out there. And if you look at three to five microns between background versus uh, uh, human body temperature, you get an enhancement of about a factor of five in the three to five micron range. Now the question is, how do you detect that, that wavelength? So we, of course, we, uh, there's a lot of technology that's being developed. So silicon is the dominant, is the big player. But there is a bunch of other materials that, that, uh, that work, gallium arsenide, indium antimonide. These are referred to as three, five semiconductors. Silicon, carbon, germanium are all group four uh, elements. 
and compound semiconductors, aluminum arsenide, gallium arsenide, indium antimonide. Indium antimonide is, uh, is a material of interest because it has what's known as a band gap. Silicon has a band gap, which is what limits it to that 1.1 or 1100 nanometer wavelength. In, uh, indium antimonide has a band gap of about 0.3 uh, electron volts, which uh, works up to five microns. So it's a nice convenient range. And we got introduced to this material when we first started working with L3 uh, communications here in Cincinnati. They worked on uh, uh, thermal imaging cameras. So we started working on uh, indium antimonide and developed familiarity with that uh, material. Uh, it's pro it's what's significant about indium antimonide is very similar to some of the other popular 3-5 semiconductors like gallium arsenide. And it's also fairly similar to silicon, not exactly similar, but it's closer than many of the other competitors that is used in thermal imaging like Mercad Telluride. So we latched on to that and continued to develop that technology, and I'll sh show some, some of the things that we are doing on that. So, what, so here's some example of the advantages, those who haven't seen thermal imaging pictures. Here's some pictures of uh, thermal imaging. So here you can see, well, of course, you can see human bodies and anything that is uh, uh, at a higher temperature. That's, that's me, by the way. You can see uh, I'm hot here. Uh, <laughs> you can see all, all, these are all areas of blood flows, and you can see which regions are colder. So it's used in medical applications. Obviously, you can see where the blood flow, there's a problem, and, uh, and even um, even in some cancer detection, people have tried because the blood flow patterns are different in cancer cells. Um, you can, of course, see through uh, objects because if you stick a lamp underneath it, of course, you collect some light, right? So this is like a lamp uh, covered by a garbage uh, bag here. You, so an infrared has different transmission properties compared to visible. So you can see s through certain materials, not all materials, through certain materials, it can be... Uh, can be used uh, for thermal imaging. So I'll talk about how we actually make these things. It's a fairly elaborate process. It's a lot of processing steps, which is what makes it a very, very difficult area to get into. So we start with an indium antimonide wafer, and then we do some what's known as implantation. We dope to create PN junctions, and we anneal, and then we pattern and etch. These are the pixels. These are a few microns in size in pixels, similar to the visible uh, silicon pixels. But of course, the material is different here. This is all indium antimonide. And then we do a bunch of other steps called passivations and put some metals on each pixel. All that is done, but we cannot actually produce pictures from it because you, we haven't figured out a way to make electronics in, in these other materials. We only know how to make electronics in silicon. So transistors, amplifiers. So remember I said in each pixel, there is amplifiers and decoding electronics that turns the pixel on and off. We don't have the technology to make electronics on 3-5 semiconductors like indium antimonide and gallium arsenide. It's not due to some fundamental limit. There is no fundamental limit. It's just the technology has not been developed. So the CMOS technology in silicon has taken decades of development uh, and that has not, uh, this is not a huge market like the silicon market, so that hasn't happened. So what's currently done is something like this. So we take the indium antimonide with the detector pixels, we flip it and glue it to a silicon wafer. Silicon is transparent in this wavelength regime. It's, it's, like a, it's like a piece of glass. You can see right through it. Then we grind away the entire indium antimonide, leaving these little pixels of indium antimonide laying on a silicon window. And then we flip it and glue it to a silicon electronic chip. Electronic chip which does all the turning on and off the pixels and detecting and amplifying, doing all the circuitry. So it looks something like this, a sandwich structure, a silicon chip with a bunch of detectors that is hybridized, flip chip bonded to, to the entire package to create these, the sensors. So that's the process that's currently used. But the issue is that when we make these pixels, we are grinding away the entire indium antimonide substrate. The cost of an indium antimonide substrate is about 50 times to 100 times greater than silicon. So one three-inch wafer, we pay about $1,000, whereas a silicon, the high-quality, premium-grade silicon, we pay maybe $30 to $50. So it's, it's, it's a pretty significant increase in cost, but we grind it away and throw it out. Throw it out. 
So it's like, you know, what if we can figure out a way to cut a slice? All we need is this thin slice, which is about one micron thick to make these pixels. What if we can slice and then reuse the silicon, uh, reuse the indium antimonide for another purpose? Sort of like, you know, if you have a block of cheese, I want just one slice of cheese to put it on my sandwich. What we are doing now is bonding the whole block of cheese to the sandwich and grinding the entire block away and throwing all the shreds. Okay, so if I can cut a nice thin slice and place it, that will be a huge benefit to the manufacturing process. So that's called a smart cut technique. It's never been tried on indium antimonide. We are the first ones to try it, and we had some limited success with that. So, but it has been tried in silicon. The SOI technology, silicon on insulator technology, has been around for a while, and that's been tried and has been successful. So what we do is accelerate hydrogen or proton ions into the indium antimonide substrate, two million volts. So it is not a trivial process, two million volts of acceleration. These hydrogen, uh, the protons are extremely tiny. So they penetrate the indium antimonide very easily and they come to a stop a certain distance below it, which is about a few microns below, which is the right distance that we need. And that creates a defect layer. Then we bond glue or silicon to it. And when we apply heat to it, it simply pops, it separates right at this defect layer, leaving this ultra-thin indium antimonide that is glued to the silicon, but the rest of the substrate is still there for you to use once again. Okay, so it's, it's a, there, there is no grinding and polishing, there's no heavy removal of material, so it saves on material cost, and also this is a, a, a much lower uh, labor cost too. That, that grinding and polishing step is, is a very uh, expensive step. So some of our recent results on that. So this is the piece of indium antimonide, and this has been bombarded with protons of two million volts on it. And you can see pieces starting to come up. This is called the exfoliation. So we remove these pieces. This is an electron microscope image that you can see this is a, a flat piece. And the nice thing about it is that this is a single crystal indium antimonide. There's no defects. The protons are so small that they penetrate through, leaving very little defects on the surface. Uh, and the th crystal thickness that we have is about, right now, 10 microns thick, which is about the right thickness that we need to produce uh, image sensors in a very affordable manufacturer. That's the advancement that we are making, is, is making a technology that can, that's currently very difficult and expensive into something that could be uh, easily manufacturable. Uh, the problems, of course, is that we would like to have one big sheet exfoliate all at once, one big sheet so that we can make a large image sensor. Right now, we get a lot of cracks and, and the defects propagating all over the place. Uh, the biggest size is a, is a few millimeters of clean space is what we are getting. So that is an area that we are pursuing. Um, another area is what if we can use silicon to detect infrared radiation? Silicon, of course, is the greatest material that we know how to work with. Uh, even though its band gap is not at the right place. What if we can use silicon? Well, it, there is another promising area that's emerged from a, uh, a technology called black silicon that started at Harvard. Uh, and they discovered that while uh, making these nanostructured needles of silicon, and, uh, and you actually created a silicon that was ordinarily 30 or 40% reflective to 0% reflective, which means that there was uh, a lot of absorption, so it appeared black. Uh, they used a different method of making these uh, uh, needles by plasma etching process, and uh, it's, a, it's a laser plasma etching process. What we did was another process where we deposit some silver, and we create some nano links. These are silver globs that are linked randomly in a nanoscale pattern, and we use the silver as a catalyst to etch the silicon underneath it, so it etches wherever there is silicon and leaves these little needles behind. So it looks like this. This is the silicon. This is about 350 angstroms wide needles and a few microns high. So it's like up to five to 10 microns. So it's a huge aspect ratios. And the interesting thing is that we recently measured the infrared uh, transmission spectrum and we see nearly full, perfect absorption right up to about six microns wavelength. And, uh, this has been corroborated by other researchers as well. So our contribution is that we are making this in a much more affordable and much more easier way 
than our uh, competitors from Harvard who came out with the paper at exactly the same time that we came up with the results. So we're pretty close, uh, but their paper is out and ours is not. So that's, that's the only difference. Um, so we are pursuing this to see whether we can harvest this energy out of silicon. So that'll be a huge improvement if we can do silicon to make infrared detectors instead of relying on other 3.5 semiconductor materials. We're also working with a, uh, a company here, uh, FMI, on uh, medical imaging is, is to replace uh, CT and PET scanners. Currently what they do, x-rays come in, they impinge a scintillation crystal, they pl produce blue photon, and then they are collected by a photomultiplier tube. That's the current method. Uh, we are actually making solid state, silicon based detectors, silicon detectors and scintillation crystals here and we put an optical funnel to funnel in the light towards the detector. The whole thing is, is made and assembled and tested right here uh, uh, on campus here and we are working closely with uh, some of my previous students actually who are now working for that uh, company developing this technology. Some other areas are polarimetric imaging. In regular image sensors, we only see color. We see red, green, blue, or different wavelengths. What if we can see polarization? Polarization contains some x-ray information. It contains, especially, it contains information about man-made versus natural uh, objects. Natural objects don't have any significant polarization. Man-made objects have significant polarization. So here is a regular image. There is a vehicle parked under the tree here that you don't see. But if you pick up this image called polarimetric imaging, you can clearly see that the man-made object has a very strong polarization component compared to natural background clutter. So how do you introduce polarization to it? Well, it turns out on each pixel, you can put a polarizer, tiny little polarizers on each pixel, but each polarizer has to be oriented in different directions. So you have to rotate the polarization, so here are these Polarizers are oriented left to right and then at 45 degrees up to down. So four different orientations of polarizers. And those polarizers are made up of nanoscale wires. So here are the wires and they are about uh, a few hundred nanometers in width, but they have to be manufactured over the entire chip to produce the polarization effect. And we are developing that technology to do polarimetric imaging uh, for silicon sensors. This is a silicon commercially available CCD chip. So we are making the polarizer grid, flip it and bond it to the regular silicon chip to enable polarimetric imaging on silicon chips. Um, all right, so towards the end, I'll just show some pictures of our lab, our capabilities here, sort of like a showcase of what we have. This, like I said, this, this was one of my proudest accomplishments here to build this from scratch. We have a class 100 uh, clean room, class 1000 area. Uh, and this, this is a fairly old uh, uh, group of students now, about two years ago. Uh, <clears throat> we do a number of thin films from sputter technology to evaporation, plasma enhanced CVD. We can handle up to six inch wafers where we build our image sensors. Some of them are six inch. Uh, these are the evaporation tools, thin films, CVD tool. Uh, photolithography, we can do down to a few hundred nanometers of contact printing, photolithography, spin coating, uh, spray develop. These are all fairly standard for photolithography. We have an, another advanced lithography method called DPUV interference lithography for making ultra fine pitch patterns on large scale six inch wafers. This is custom built, it's very unique. There's not many people have this kind of capability where we can make Nanoscale features, these, these are nanoscale features down to 100 nanometer wide lines over full three inch wafers. Uh, plasma etching capability, uh, wafer bonding, hybridization, these are flip chip bonding for the image sensors that I talked about and some characterization facilities. So we have a whole suite of uh, fabrication facilities in a clean room where all of this is possible. <clears throat> 